This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. We have some new details on the Synod of Synodality from places other than Germany, and they're really, really eye-opening. They show that proposed changes to the faith coming from the laity echo the desires of Francis, almost as if the powers that be in Rome have carefully guided this whole process of the synod from the top down, that is, outcomes are preordained. Some of these changes are rather unbelievable for those of us who simply want the same Catholic faith as our ancestors, and yet for many others, they see it as a common sense extension and continuation of Vatican II, which I don't think I actually disagree with that sentiment, though not for any reason that anyone who makes such an argument would think. And it begs the question, what are they really after with all of this? So today, let's explore the update out of the Synod of Spain, which will sound familiar to you. And in a way that some people will think is unconnected, but really isn't, we're going to talk about what some American prelates are saying about Francis's declaration of us all being naughty, bad, meanie, poo-poo-headed restorationists, because Francis's comments are really revealing a great deal about the state of the church in our time. So let's dive in. To Spain we go, a country that hasn't received a lot of attention in America or the English-speaking world, despite its synod being nearly as bad as Germany's. The Spanish National Bishops' Conference has issued its synodal report, which was compiled by the laity for the most part. And it's a Christmas wish list for the modernists, as was expected. If you name a break from the Catholic faith that we've seen play out in Germany, You'll see it in the Spanish report, just presented in a way that isn't overtly threatening apostasy and schism, like we saw in Germany, which is probably why this hasn't made waves across the pond, like the actions of the Germans have. Headline from FSSPX.News, the official news outlet of the SSPX. Synod on synodality, a predicted disaster. It seems the Society of St. Pius X aren't exactly the biggest fans of the synod on synodality. That's not really a surprise, of course, since Francis probably had SSPX clergy and laymen first in mind for his bizarre new title, Restorationists, for traditional Catholics. According to this story, the Synod on Synodality is an unmitigated disaster that is pushing the most bizarre but otherwise predictable forms of modernism imaginable, including a call for something called animating liturgy. I'm not really sure what they mean by that, but the example here is from the Synodal Assembly of the Spanish Episcopal Conference, Really, this could be from almost anywhere. From the article, quote, The diocesan phase of the Synod on Synodality in Spain ended on June 11, 2022, with a final synodal assembly of the Spanish Episcopal Conference taking place in Madrid, and with the official closing of the synodal phase. A number of lay synod members participated in this last assembly. The assembly presented the final synthesis of the documents gathered during the diocesan phase. From the opening of the Synod, October 10th, 2021, until its closing in Spain on June 11th, 2022, all Spanish dio dioceses, religious congregations, secular and contemplative life institutes, apostolic movements, and many other apostolic institutions were involved. The appeal by Pope Francis to participate in the Synod was accepted with enthusiasm and hope, and it was understood that the purpose of this diocesan phase was not to answer a questionnaire, but to begin to incorporate synodality as a fundamental part of the being of the church and the synodal style derived from it as the appropriate way to do church. We find that the liturgy is lived in a cold, passive, ritualized, monotonous, and distant manner. This is largely due to a lack of formation about its content, which leads to a misunderstanding of what it is and what it means, and a lack of participation in its development, which leads to indifference." End quote. As the unnamed author of the piece says, this is the exact same charge leveled by some at Vatican II towards the traditional Latin Mass. What that means is that at least one Episcopal conference says your typical moderate middling Novus Ordo at your typical parish is too rigid, too neo-pharisaical. All of that is too rigid for the springtime of the Church of the New Advent. That's reassuring, I guess. Their solution to fix this inborn rigidity in the Novus Ordo is the following, quote, This is why it is essential to strengthen liturgical formation and promote lively and fruitful participation 
through the creation of liturgical animation teams. It is also necessary to think seriously about the adaptation of languages, vestments, and certain rites more distant from the present time. All things inscribed in the council for almost 60 years. They also advocate dialogue with the world to abandon the vision of a church of maintenance to move on to an authentic church of exit because the church is perceived as a reactionary institution with few proposals far from today's world. Rightly so, because this world, and especially that of today, is opposed to the church, the author of that SSPX article tells us. It is necessary to come to, quote, certain specific themes which found a strong resonance. First of all, the reference to the role of women in the church as a preoccupation, a necessity, and an opportunity. Their importance in the building and maintenance of our communities is appreciated, and their presence as the organs of responsibility and decision-making of the church is considered essential. There is clear concern about the limited presence and participation of young people in the life and mission of the church. The family is considered a priority area for evangelization. End quote. Obviously, the author was interjecting some of their own observations in that piece, but I think you get the idea. The Spanish document goes on and says, we need to strengthen lay institutions, regularize the James Martin topic, and have the church submit to the position of the world on that particular issue. All the things that Francis's closest allies in the Roman Curia have wanted, and things that Francis has himself openly called for or hinted at overtly often, depending on the topic. How rather convenient for the modernists. But this is all just part of a broader problem. I showed you that not only so you can pray for the church in Spain, since obviously they need your prayers very badly, given what I just told you, I showed you that to contrast it with this. The National Catholic Register had a discussion between several churchmen about Francis's recent remarks about rigid restorationists, his new loaded nickname for traditional Catholics. I personally have mixed feelings about trying to adopt the term restorationist, since it all too easily allows us to get dubbed with the heresy of archaeologism, which I've covered on the channel before. Accusing traditional Catholics of archaeologism would be, of course, a false accusation, but adopting the term restorationist for our own purpose in any serious way would make that easier if we are concerned at all about their accusations. This roundtable discussion talked about this, and well, to give you an idea, they believe that Vigano is the leader of the traditional Catholic movement, which is weird because honestly, a lot of traditional Catholics have mixed feelings about Archbishop Vigano. I'm sure you've noticed that by now. But here's what they had to say about this. They were asked about Francis's use of restorationists and the rejection of Vatican II by some in the US, mostly according to their perception, and they said the following. Quote, I think the Holy Father holds this view because it is true. The most vocal spokesman for this view is Archbishop Carlo Vigano, who is also critical, seemingly to the point of contempt, of Pope Francis. Vigano rejects Vatican II, claiming it represents a diabolical inroad into the church and the triumph of the stonecutters from within the ranks of the hierarchy. Vigano has groups of loosely connected followers in the U.S., with a range of buy-in that goes from taking his critique as possibly legitimate to accepting it fully. Why are they a more prominent factor now? Many, whether rightly or wrongly, perceive Francis as favoring those who argue approvingly that the church was a break with the church's past, an approach that has only been half-heartedly embraced by those who, like JP II and Benedict, believe the conciliar reforms were in genuine continuity with the church's tradition, and in fact, in some cases, a recovery of it. Ironically, the quote-unquote restorationists agree with those who believe the council was a break with the past, only they view the break as bad, while the quote liberals, they believe Francis is favoring, believe the rupture was good, and much of the past should be left behind, end quote. We make the claim that Francis is favoring those within the hierarchy who say that Vatican II was a break from the past because it's obviously true. They said it themselves. Archbishop Roach, the man who is taking the lead on smashing the traditional liturgy of the Latin rite of the church, is being made a cardinal in two months' time. And he has said that the preconciliar form of the Mass is not compatible with the ecclesiology of Vatican II, which is a fancy way of saying that the church is fundamentally different now, and that Catholicism is basically a new religion, different than what it was before. He said that. Francis promoted him instead of stripping him of his rank and banishing him to a monastery. Roach said it was a rupture, and Francis promoted him after saying it. He didn't only say it once, he said it in numerous times in numerous interviews, as I've shown you in the past few months on this channel. He did it as if he was taunting his critics. The panel takes a hardline hermeneutic of continuity approach and scornfully dismisses our concerns that the leading lights of Vatican II were modernists. 
notice here that they failed to address that the figures they positively cite were in fact being watched by the old holy office for suspicion of heresy before the council. All the names you're going to hear here, many of whom you may have positive feelings for now, were watched before the council under suspicion of heresy. That is just a historic fact. Quote, there can be little doubt that there's been an increase in the number of devout American Catholics who identify as quote unquote traditionalists who publicly espoused restorationist views. And by restorationist, I mean those who seek to roll back the reforms of the council in both liturgy and doctrine. Specifically, the movement to restore the old mass often involves cutting criticisms of the mass of Paul VI to the point of referring to the new mass as borderline heretical and as spiritually corrupting. They go way beyond legitimate criticism of certain aspects of the new mass and trend toward rejecting it to core. There is also criticism in these circles of the council's teaching on ecumenism, interreligious dialogue, salvation outside of the visible church, and religious freedom. They view such reforms with a jaundiced eye and refer to the resourcement theology that inspired the council from such figures as Henry de, Lub de Lubach and Joseph Ratzinger as quote-unquote modernist. Therefore, they do indeed reject the main impetus of the council and seek to return the church to her pre-1962 form in both liturgy, theology, and doctrine. Many of them call for the council to be simply set aside as a pastoral failure and for a future pope to repudiate many of his teachings, end quote. I agree positively with, with the final things that they said there because that's pretty much all true. That is what traditionalists really do want. And here's the thing. Those people they named, they were modernists, at least at the time. These are the better voices in the church saying this about traditional Catholics, though. These are the types who will get promotions if a pope comes in the next conclave modeled after Benedict the Sixteenth. That is just a fact. So these talking heads defend what Francis says about quote-unquote restorationists because they have to. They go on to attack the people I call the hypermodernists, the James Martin types and the rest without naming names, those who took the council and inserted their own ideas into the magisterial text, so the narrative goes anyway, and the same people who reject the Benedict XVI ratzing or reading and implementation of those documents. The mainstream view of traditional Catholics is this perceived middle way. That's how Francis's admonition of restorationism is being used in America by the same people Francis was signaling his disgust with when he elevated Bishop McElroy to the College of Cardinals. It's all so very tiresome. It really is. It reminds me of secular political figures who have generally sensible views on a lot of things, thinking they can talk the agents of chaos who are presently running the American government into doing sensible things, and think that tired old approach to policy solutions will solve the problems created and made worse by the agents of chaos. It's the same sort of thinking. I'm missing the forest for the trees. I like using context and contrast here to make my point. So I'm going to use another contrast here in the closing minutes of this episode. Crisis Magazine published a piece by Anthony Esselin where at the start he declares himself to be a restorationist. Remember at the beginning, I stated how I have mixed feelings on the use of that term. Dr. Esselin has no such qualms and begins by declaring himself to be a restorationist before telling the story of how after the council, he, his family, and his fellow parishioners at his family parish trusted their priest and obeyed the bishop who recovated their parish when they stripped the altars laid bare their parish of the classically Catholic decorations, and even when the teachings on moral issues began to change. They obeyed, and they obeyed, and they obeyed, all in the face of enormous change, because after all, they thought, the church knew better, right? But then he gives us, gives us this, and remember what the Spanish laity said at the start about the Novus Ordo Mass being too rigid, which is just hilarious, and remember what that panel, the National Catholic Register feature, said about the Restorationists, meaning traditional Catholics, and our desire to roll back the so-called reforms of Vatican II. Dr. Eslin describes this rather aptly when he talks about the effects of minimalism. Quote, I confess, I've come to see the connections between minimalism in art and minimalism in morality, between minimalism in our appreciation of the sexes and minimalism in our sense of the fatherhood of God, and between all forms of minimalism, that is, modernism, and the scrubbing out of vast fields of learning and beauty, between the priest who scorns what our Lord himself says about the sins of the flesh, because what he says is supposedly old and time-bound, and the student who scorns reading Chaucer or even Dickens, and for the same reasons." End quote. That's really much of what modernism is, minimalism, minimalizing the mass, and as a consequence, minimalizing people's faith, how they live it, what they are bound to do as Catholics in their daily lives, 
even what they are bound to do after they go to the rare confession and confess scores of sins of the flesh. And the effect is to minimize the faith, to undermine the faith. That's really what we are up against, really, is this minimalization. Dr. Esselin describes the implications of removing Saints Christopher and George from the liturgical calendar after the Council. The Vatican, the Francis's of their day in the post-conciliar era, did it because they declared St. Christopher, St. George, St. Lucy, and St. Barbara to have been the stuff of myths and fables, and not actually having been real. I mean, St. George slew a dragon, and the church had fallen in lockstep with the world on science, and what the world said about science down to the very last detail, the church submitted to it. So of course St. George couldn't possibly exist, that's what we were told. They told us that. They did that with no thought of the implications of what that action would mean. By claiming that the church was wrong historically on the existence and canonization of some saints, what else could the church have been wrong about? Thus, we got the rejection of the moral deposit of the faith thereafter as an unconscious consequence. We saw a rejection of the faith itself come, an apostasy of sorts, with Catholicism being reduced to a brand or an identity instead. This is what Francis and the rest of the modernists don't understand about restorationism. What we want to restore is the faith itself. Full stop. So what do you think about all this? Today's episode was a little longer than usual, but I think it was necessary. We saw the pushing of the further minimalizing of the faith by the laity in Spain. We saw American prelates cheerleading Francis's excoriation of those of us who simply want the same faith as our great-grandparents. And we saw Dr. Esselin really remind us of what has been taken from us and of what Francis and his probable successor are wanting to keep from us. The same Catholic faith in all of its expressions that our grandparents knew. What do you think of all this? Let me know in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As does sharing these episodes on social media. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.